I guess um, we can start. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everyone, depending on your, on your end. Uh, you are welcome to join the virtual parallel forum of the United Nations Women's 67th session under the topic of promoting climate justice through innovation in the digital age. I'm Dr. Joseph Olivier Mendou, uh, International Volunteer Chief Officer at the Change Air Education Foundation, and I'll be moderating this uh, parallel session. Uh, but before we begin, uh, we've prepared a brief video to showcase the work uh, the work uh, the Change Air Education uh, Foundation does, uh, which will play uh, for you now. So please, uh, can you play the video? role in sustainable development. Chinese NGOs must take international responsibilities. As the Chinese non-governmental organization in special consultative status of the UN Economic and Social Council, Beijing Change Education Foundation is committed to AIDS prevention and control education for adolescents and public welfare undertakings for women and children. Change Your Project covered 28 provinces and cities in China, with a total of 30 million beneficiaries, of which 60% are girls and women who got access to fair education and development opportunities. With established contacts with many international organizations, such as ANAIDS, UNESCO, and many institutions in China from developing countries. Together, we share experience train personnel, provide funding, jointly promote the protection of the rights and interests of women and children, enhance the role of women in sustainable development, and help to join more global forces to achieve the UN 2030 Sustainable Development Goals as scheduled, and create a better future for women around the world. Okay, uh, thank you very much for the video. Uh, now let's just dive into a uh, specific. Um, so uh, the climate crisis is a political, social, and ethical issue rather than a purely environmental one. It is caused by an unsustainable economic model that unequally distributes wealth and power in the world. At the same time, it exacerbates uh, the inequality by affecting those who are least responsible uh, the most uh, people and countries with low incomes and long histories of oppressions are the ones facing the worst impact of climate change, despite having contributed to uh, the least to cause it. So today we are very fortunate to have a few guest speaker who will share with us their thoughts on how to promote or achieve climate justice through innovation in the digital age. So without further ado, let's welcome our first guest speaker, Ms. Shura. Yarina Shura is a specialist in climate change and sustainable development policies. She is currently serving as a climate consultant at the UN Department of Economic and Social Affairs, working on method and practices for a synergies implementation of climate and development goals. Previously, she worked at the UN Office for Coordination of Humanitarian Affairs where she led the analysis of the climate change impacts in a humanitarian context. So, uh, Ms. Shura, uh, the floor is yours. Thank you so much. Let me share my PowerPoint. Okay. Good afternoon, good, uh, good afternoon, everyone, distinguished uh, guests, and ladies and gentlemen. I'm honored to be here today with you, joined by this amazing panel of speakers. And I'm pleased to bring today my experience of collaborating with multiple stakeholder groups around the globe to elevate their voices, experiences, and solutions on the intersectionality between climate change and sustainable development. So as we know, the world today is facing a crisis like no other, the climate crisis. Everyone experiences effects, but not everyone is affected in the same way. We know that due to limited access to resources and information, women and girls are more likely to be affected by climate disasters. In fact, 80% of people displaced in cl by climate emergencies are women. 
Financially, we know that low-income countries had losses three times higher than high-income countries over the past 20 years. Geographically, we see that people living in coastal and arid areas are affected the hardest. In regions like Sub-Saharan Africa, where between 30 and 50 percent of population lives under the poverty line, an estimated 40 uh, 400 million people are at the risk of water scarcity, leading to tremendous food insecurity due to climate change. So in this scenario, if we don't consider the adverse outcomes of climate change on different social groups, we, don't, we won't be able to deliver appropriate measures and can further contribute to structural inequalities. So to achieve climate justice, we must unpack the granularity of these various effects and address them accordingly to the context-specific inequalities. Since every social reality is unique, um, I would like to focus today on the intersection of key humanitarian priorities for development and the climate action. But I want to highlight that working on each of these aspects, we'll need to take in consideration all social issues in order to truly um, ensure justice in that particular community. Uh, by analyzing some SDGs through a climate lens, I will try to draw a picture of how uh, some sustainable development targets will contribute to, uh, to gaining equity, in innovation and development, and at the same time uh, can help tackle climate crisis. Um, so since we are at the 67th session of the, of the Commission on Sustain on Status of Women, uh, I would like to start with the SDG 5. Um, achieving gender equality and empower all women and girls. As mentioned previously, uh, women are often more vulnerable to the impacts of climate change. The burden is more severe in communities where gender inequality is upheld by age-old tradition, uh, with limited access to education and uh, work and economic inclusion is not guaranteed. For instance, in 2021, climate shocks prevented at least 4 million women and girls in lower income countries from finishing their education mainly because they had to, uh, to provide vital support to their family compared to boys. By deploying economic tools, such as providing greater access to cash transfer, savings, credit, and insurance, backed by education and financial trainings, we can help women gain economic power and ability to protect themselves from climate shocks. Uh, additionally, provided an inclusive um, and, equi and uh, equitable education, the SDG4, would help them take action on climate change and participate in decision-making processes. This can help to address the gender gap in science, technology, engineering, and math, and provide women in this, uh, with the skills and knowledge needed to participate in the development and implementation of innovation solutions to climate change. Regarding regional inequalities, as mentioned before, Africa is the most vulnerable country to climate change impacts. However, only 37% of the population have heard about climate change, understand its effects, or know how to adapt or mitigate the effects. Education about climate change not only will help communities to find ways to adapt to their, uh, to their lives, um, adapt their lives to climate change, but also will serve to develop context-specific tools um, to fight the change on the long run. Um, the issue with the African con continent, uh, con countries, for example, um, is that both development and humanitarian actors throughout the years adopted a system of parachuting um, external experts to address critical issues with their own methods and knowledge, um, which, however, has been demonstrated that local and indigenous uh, expertise are often more suitable um, and more experienced at responding to crisis in their own context. So this leads me to another SDG, mainly the SDG 9 on uh, resilient infrastructure and uh, industrialization and innovation. So development of um, climate resilient technology is key to foster climate action in both adaptation and mitigation aspects. However, there are several problems related to justice in how the technology is projected, deployed and distributed. Building on my previous example of the African continent, for example, there are many barriers for equal technological opportunities in disadvantaged countries, which include high cost of the capital, limited technology transfer, and scarce productivity, productive capacity. Um, governments and international organizations play a key role uh, in overcoming these barriers through designing advantageous policies. In this context, it is important to recognize that knowledge and technologies developed in one part of the world may not be applicable or effective in another part of the world, where local conditions and context may be very different. 
For this reason, it is important to support and promote the development of local, uh, locally driven and context specific solutions to climate change, which can better address and, uh, the needs and challenges of local communities. For instance, indigenous peoples have uh, developed um, and refined sustainable land use practices over centuries and are often ba based on a deep understanding of local ecosystems and natural resources. These practices can contribute to reducing emissions, enhancing biodiversity, and restoring and degraded ecosystems, while also providing economic and social benefits for local communities. Another umbrella of technologies able to contribute sustainably to climate justice are renewable, renewable energy through the SDG 7. As many of us know, energy sector is the biggest emitter of the greenhouse gases. Turning towards renewable energy will not only reduce the global emissions tremendously, but also contribute to better air quality, create new jobs, sustainable jobs, um, save money, and advance access to reliable sources of energy in remote areas. As a G7 is key to fight climate change and to guarantee equal opportunities around the world. For instance, in certain communities, women are heavily affected by ineffective uh, polluting cooking systems, uh, still in use in, um, by nearly 2.4 billion people worldwide. We know that universal access to clean cooking alone uh, could avoid 1.8 million premature deaths per year. Uh, the adoption of renewable energy sources, such as solar and wind, and wind power, uh, can reduce these burdens and provide women with more time and opportunities to engage in other activities, uh, as we mentioned, education or income generating activities. And so we're already seeing these benefits of the energy revolution in a lot of uh, remote areas. However, those who, will st uh, who still lack access to re um, and rely on unsustainable solutions are the developing countries of Africa and Asia and marginalized communities in particular, such as migrants and uh, women and girls as well. In order to the, um, to the energy revolution to be successful, the transition must be just, and this can be guaranteed through a meaningful participation of the whole of society in decision-making processes. So lastly, the SDG 16, to promote peaceful and inclusive societies. Uh, civil society plays a crucial role in monitoring, reporting, and participating in the fight against climate change. It is imperative to empower individuals and communities to hold those in power accountable for their actions as well as inactions. Youth-led movements and other um, activists uh, put pressure on governments to take more uh, accelerated action on climate change, and we saw it extensively in the past few years. Uh, with the youth-led uh, protest. Um, these movements also raise awareness of the issue among the general public, which can be, uh, which can take proactive decisions um, on climate. So to conclude, I want to restate that climate crisis is one of the most uh, significant challenges we face today. It is a challenge that affects us all and requires our all collective action. So harnessing climate and SDG synergies, is the program that I'm currently working on. Um, it is created by UNDESA and UNFCCC with the purpose of mobilizing member states, private sector, and civil society to collaborate and come up with interlinked measures for climate and development goals. We think that only by implementing these two agendas simultaneously, we can achieve climate justice, um, and through our regional workshops and analysis, we really try to develop capacities of local actors, provide evidence, and suggest policies with both climate and development co-benefits. We are really eager to engage as many stakeholders as possible, so I really look forward to connecting with all of you um, who, who would like to learn more about this initiative, um, and I will drop a link in the chat for any further information. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Ms. Shura, for shedding light and giving us your perspective uh, when it comes to SDG 5 on gender equality, uh, the SDG 9, industry innovation and infrastructure, and 7, affordable clean energy, energy and while dropping to the SDG 16, peace and justice. And also, uh, you ended up, your actually conclusion resonates with the uh, with uh, the quote from the Secretary General of the United Nations mentioning climate, climate action is the 21st century greatest opportunity to uh, uh, drive forward all the SDGs. So thank you very much for your insights. Uh, let's move on to the next speaker. Uh, on our schedule, we also have uh, Bui Kang, uh, who is a Hong Kong native and the co and the co generator of the True Collective based in Costa Rica, where she and her partner share uh, knowledge and composting waste 
uh, reduction, promoting agroecology and regenerative agriculture, and strive to practice a decolonial, a decolonial way of living. Uh, she is an urban farmer, composter, writer, and regenerative practitioner. She was educated at the University of Hong Kong, Mount uh, Holyoke College, and University uh, International Cooperation. So please, uh, Ms. Boyle Kong, the floor is yours. Thank you, Dr. Olivier. Um, and thank you everyone for sharing this space with us today. Thank you to our simultaneous interpreters. I'm also grateful for the Changier Foundation for this platform for youth voices. So today I want to tell you all a story about two friends who reversed decertification using technology, since our topic is technology, right? In the 1970s, hundreds of thousands of people died from famine in the northern regions of Burkina Faso because of severe desertification from poor land management, overpopulation, and drought. Many people left their rural homes to find livelihood in cities, but Yakuba Sawadogo did the opposite. He went back to the arid, desertified rural areas. Together with his friend, Mathieu Wadrogo, Yakuba started to observe the land and landscape, and he did some experimenting. First, they placed fist-sized stones across the fields. Then they dug deep holes in the dry ground and filled these holes with manure and organic matter. The manure and organic matter in these holes attracted termites who dug the tunnels deeper into the earth to further break out the soil. So when it finally, finally rained, the stones they placed and the holes they dug slowed the flow of rainwater and allowed it to sleep, seep into the dry and bare soil. And the termites tunnels helped the water penetrate even further, slowly filling up the water table. If you visited Yakuba's farm in the 70s, all you would have seen was desertic sandy landscape. By the 80s and 90s, it was a green lush food forest, home to more than 60 species of trees and bushes, as well as a variety of wildlife, feeding thousands of families. So what Yakuba and Mathieu did was use tra traditional indigenous technologies, applying them in an ingenious, elegant, and regenerative way. Yakuba showed us that technology doesn't have to be connected to electricity or Wi-Fi, that the appropriate use of technology comes from nature's wisdom, and that in achieving climate justice, technologies must be used to preserve and restore nature's processes and not disrupt them. Yakuba's story shows us how to use technology with eco-consciousness. So how can we do the same? Well, I'm going to answer this big question by taking us on a journey. First, let's journey into the nature within ourselves. In the modern capitalist society, many of us have become misaligned with nature. We forget to listen to our bodies. We learn to ignore the ancestral wisdom that lies within us. We have become fragmented with intergenerational trauma from a violent ecosystem, uh, sorry, violent economic system, from a violent histories and from a violent society that has defined us and put us into boxes and categories. We've been told what is normal, what's abnormal, what we want and what we need. So amidst all of this chaos and confusion, how can we heal ourselves? How does nature heal itself? Well, we are nature, so surely we have an innate ability to heal too. Maybe we can start by having a healthy relationship with all the beings around us. I was looking out the garden one morning, my own garden in my front yard, and I noticed that the corn that I planted a few months ago started to flower. Without me asking for it, the two meter corn was giving shade, breaking wind, holding the soil intact, providing shelter and food to birds and insects, pumping carbon and water into my small front yard. And soon it gave me three years of delicious corn. In fact, here they are. I just harvested them. I don't know if you can see. <laughs> it's, a, it's a native corn called Pujagua in Costa Rica and it's purple. So swaying in the wind, the corn seemed to be asking me, what is my role in my little front yard ecosystem? How can I have a reciprocal relationship with all the other beings? That morning, I made a promise to this corn that I would make sure that she thrives, that she gets pollinated properly, and that when she gives her life, the rest of her will be composted and recycled, and that she will continue to live through the seeds that she gives, which I'm saving here. 
When we realize that we are nature and a part of nature, when we stop trying to separate ourselves or dominate nature, when we stop extracting and taking, taking, taking without giving anything back, we will realize that humans can, in fact, live in harmony with other beings. And we have, in fact, lived for millennia with the environment, as many indigenous peoples, like Yarina has mentioned, have shown and are showing us. Technology isn't new to us or to nature for that matter. We modern human beings just have to unlearn some of the things we've learned from an extractive capitalist system and remember how to truly live because that knowledge and wisdom is within us. So now let's venture out into the natural world around us. Like many indigenous peoples and regenerative farmers, we can start by recognizing every single thing in our living environment as unique individuals. The Native American Anishinaabe peoples count trees as people, the standing people, they call them. Robin Wall Kimmerer writes in her book, Braiding Sweetgrass, that if we were to carry out a biologically in inclusive census in our neighborhoods, then animals, insects, trees, plants would surely outnumber humans by a lot. What would decision making look like if we took their voices into account? We need to step out of our anthropocentric worldview. When I started to learn about the lives and importance of every living thing around me, I stopped killing spiders at home because they kept the mosquito population at bay. I stopped pulling out weeds in my garden because they provided insects with food and in fact kept the insects from eating my plants or my crops like my bok choy. I started to appreciate the community of microbes residing in my gut, keeping me healthy. And I started to compost food waste to feed the soil instead of sending it to the landfill. And in terms of technology, nature has a super repertoire of them. Beavers, dams, swallows, nests, beehives, the best technologies flow with nature. Take composting. Wise humans have learned to cooperate with nature's microorganisms to decompose organic matter and recycle nutrients back into the soil. Or companion planting. Observant humans have learned to grow different plants together to enhance their health, growth, and flavor. Or medicines. Curious humans watched what kinds of plants animals ate when they got sick, and what plants animals rubbed their wounds against and used these plants to cure their diseases. All we have to do is be humble students of nature. Now, finally, let's explore the intricate relationships that link everything. As with many of the big climate, environmental, social, economic issues that we try to solve, they are undoubtedly complex. What makes them complex is that there are multiple perspectives, layers, and solutions. They're nested within ecosystems. There are relationships involved between human beings, more than human beings, like insects, animals, soil, water, and air. For every one of these big problems, we're searching for solutions. There is a place, a community, and a context they exist in. We need to recognize the complexity, complexity before even beginning to problem solve. We are used to mainstream Western mindset in the past century, which is a mechanistic way of thinking, reducing everything down to its atom or cell so that we can try to study, control everything. Similarly, a lot of technologies aim at only solving one part of the problem. For example, when we use chemical pesticides on farms to kill insects eating our crops, we are also killing bees, butterflies, and other pollinators. So we are endangering our own food system. So when you don't see and appreciate the whole system and learn to design for it holistically, you won't be able to see the unintended solutions, uh, sorry, unintended consequences of your actions elsewhere in the system. To conclude, eco-consciousness is fundamental to everything we do, and even more fundamental when we're trying to make big decisions that will affect others' lives, like more than human beings, and future generations. We can grow our eco-consciousness by appreciating our own role in the regeneration of the planet, or by recognizing the agencies of all lives, and by seeing beyond the anthropocentric worldview, by embracing complexity and the whole system seeing, feeling, and thinking. Because without eco-consciousness, we will keep solving our problems with shallow band-aid solutions. If we keep disrupting nature's processes, we are inevitably disrupting our own processes and, well, digging our own grave. There are different ways to use technology, to extract, to destroy, or to regenerate, to unite, to connect. It's up to us how we use technology. 
Do we want technology to preserve and restore and honor nature? Or will we keep using it to destroy and extract from Mother Earth and ourselves? Thank you. Okay, uh, thank you very much, uh, Ms. Bowie. And uh, starting from the story of your two friends in Burkina Faso, uh, how they, uh, you know, in their farm, how it changed from traditional engineering technology used in um, an original or one of kind way. And also through your uh, speech, you know, you let us actually um, understand the, the, the term lead by example, you know, contributing uh, to achieve big changes from your, from your small actions. So thank you very much, um, Ms. Bowie. Okay, so uh, let's move to uh, the next speaker. Uh, the other guest that we have on the agenda uh, is uh, Lily Kareb. So Lily Kareb is a recent MBA graduate with deep ties to regeneration and farming. Throughout her college career, she studied management, finance, analytic, and economics, eventually picking up a minor in a holistic uh, psychology and using her required internship to work on local farm. She was the co-president of the Environmental Club. In 2021, she was actually selected to present her economic research on GDP at a national conference of undergraduate research. So Lily Kara, please, the floor is all yours. Thanks so much, Dr. Olivier. Hi everyone, this morning I want to talk about how we assume that advancing technology is the future, but sometimes to understand best practices, we must take a thoughtful look back. As a society, we have teetered off a path of balance for the sake of endless growth, and as a result, our natural resources are depleting. As an MBA graduate who spent her college summers wrist deep in the soil of local farms, I'm drawn again and again to the idea of regeneration to find our way back to a state of balance, whether in farming or economics. While I'm no expert in this field, I can certainly speak to my five years as a business student and so-called farmer in training. It's our natural, human, and social capital that allow our economies and our societies to function. Natural capital being our water, soil, minerals, plants, and animals, human capital being the knowledge, skills, and health that we accumulate throughout our lives, and social capital being the networks among people that create constructs of trust, cooperation, and reciprocity. They all work in conjunction with each other. So consider for a second here what we would have without our natural capital. Could any level of technology save us without access to food or water? Without natural capital, human capital can't be accumulated. And without our human capital, we can't have social capital like the ability to organize together to create farms, economies, or even families. So here's the problem. Our global economy doesn't consider that these three forms of capital are necessary for it to function and grow. This is why we have hungry people, unsatisfied workers, and a degrading planet all at the same time. So Herman Daly, who, who was the senior economist at the National Bank, put it really well. He said that the current national accounting system treats the earth as a business in liquidation. Put simply, our global economic systems are unintentionally built to utilize every ounce of nature to grow larger and wealthier. Without replenishing those resources, it takes from. Our economic system wasn't built to understand the fact that without natural capital, we have no food, no water, no air, no humans. It runs on growth without boundaries. The unchecked global capitalist system that we live in right now assumes that we have unlimited natural capital and resources. The first people, indigenous people all over the globe, believe that the earth is a partner, not a commodity. They live within the natural bounds of their land, understanding that if there's no mutual respect, then there's no future for them. Of course, now it is their land that is being disproportionately affected by climate change. And this is a classic case of why we're here together talking about climate justice. Indigenous people have a reciprocal relationship with the land that they live on. Reciprocation is a mutual giving and receiving between two entities, and the entities that we're talking about commonly this morning are humans and the earth. 
Regenerative farming and economics are modeled after these notions of reciprocity and care that allowed indigenous societies to thrive for years and years. Sometimes reciprocity means waiting, which is not something that 21st century humans in the digital age are used to doing. We try to do this in America by creating regulations in nature and praying that people follow them. For instance, by law, if a lobsterman catches a mother lobster with eggs, they must throw it back into the ocean. This creates the opportunity for us to enjoy lobster in the future, but it involves waiting because it takes up to seven years for a lobster to grow to a legal size of being caught. And sometimes reciprocity means forgetting about the money involved in a project. Another thing that 21st century humans in the digital age are not used to doing. For instance, we all know here that there are many benefits of leaving a forest uncut, fostering eco-diversity, improving water quality in lakes and rivers, manu manufacturing oxygen, but none of those thing three things translate into economic gain. In an indigenous society, these things would still be held in high regard despite this. In our capitalist society, if we can cut down the forest to put up a healthcare building or fancy new apartments, we're going to, because that's what will make us money and help our economy grow. We don't pay mind either to the indigenous peoples who utilize that forest or that land that gets destroyed. Forests will be cut to put up buildings and foster economic prosperity, not considering that the prosperity of natural capital and human capital is being left behind. So with all that I've said about our economy and growth so far, I think it's a really important time here for me to mention that I don't think growth is a bad thing. I don't spend my free time cursing capitalism, technology, and our economic systems. I studied them and I appreciate where they've gotten us. I just believe we're better as a society than we've been acting like, doing life and making big decisions with money-making blinders on. So I studied business and I earned my MBA while studying holistic psychology and working on farms. Having a holistic approach means identifying a problem and then stepping back to understand the situations that led us there. This is what we're doing here, talking about climate change and climate justice by zooming out and considering how we got here. When I studied business, something felt off, like I couldn't find a beating heart within it. It felt cold, dark, and it didn't feel reciprocal at all. For me, I found farming to be that beating heart of business. It made me feel grounded and made me feel like I was living in reciprocation every single day. It made business feel grounded. Food affects all of us, and it has the chance to bring all of us together because it's the one thing that we have in common. So I've worked in the field on many farms throughout the past five years, and I've experienced how it feels to crouch under cherry tomato vines and painstakingly pick each one for over eight hours a day in the hot sun. I've experienced on a small scale how it feels to sit in the accountant seat on a small local farm when we have a July where it rains every single day and an August where it doesn't rain at all. I found myself loving the organization of farming, the way a day's plans can shift in a matter of minutes and how I could see the difference I was making each weekend in the people I was selling vegetables to at the farmer's markets. So while we're thinking globally about climate change, it's important to zoom in and look around at our communities. The more goodness happening in those small spaces, the more goodness we can reach across the globe, especially in these times where we are experiencing the doom and gloom feelings of climate change. It's important to look to our neighbors and realize that we can thrive by living in re reciprocity with one another. Even something as small as working on reciprocation in our daily life could start to have compounding effects for the rest of the world. Without nature, we can't be humans or organized together to give life meaning. We're living in a system now that believes we have unlimited natural resources without giving back to the planet. And as a result of that, we're in trouble. As we intend to create more balance in our systems, 
we bring forth ideas around regeneration, which are modeled after indigenous thought and practices. To thrive as a society, we must protect our natural capital. And to do that, we must be in a place where we can not only hear, but understand that statement. So I'm gonna say it again. To thrive as a society, we must protect our natural capital. Everything we do is connected and it all requires balance, whether we like it or not, whether or not it takes some waiting or some losing money. One of the ways forward from where we are now is creating a more reciprocal relationship with the earth, just as indigenous people have for ages. So I ask everyone here today to think of one way that they can create more reciprocity within their lives by the end of this week, whether that's with the earth or with a friend. Find a place to compost your food scraps, take the garbage out for your mom or dad, be there for a friend who's been there for you before. Practice reciprocity that one time and notice how it makes you feel. If it makes you feel good, keep on with it and see where it takes you and potentially the rest of the world. Thank you. Okay, um, thank you very much, uh, Ms. Karak. It was very interesting the way you connected your academic journey uh, to the discussion and also very edifying uh, for, you know, re-emphasizing that the natural capital, human capital and social capital are intertwined, that there's a, nex a nexus um, between the three and you landed on two key words that I uh, actually remember, connection and balance. So thank you very much, uh, Ms. Uh, Karab. And let's move to the next speaker, uh, who is Mr. Daniel Chang. Daniel Zhang, he's a junior at Blair Academy High School in the U.S. He's an optimistic, curious, and insightful student who loves human, uh, humanities subjects. He enjoys uh, creative writing and poetry, uh, and poetry is his favorite type of literature. In addition, he has found his interest in nature, in nature's beauty and uh, preservation, and he has published an article in the European Journal of Humanities and Social Sciences and received two awards in poetry. So Daniel Zhang, please, the floor is yours. Hi everyone, I'm Daniel Zhang, a junior at Blair Academy in New Jersey, United States. I want to start my speech today with a poem I wrote titled, Ode to Lightning. Fast and unpredictable, flickering bodies, dancing alone in the summer rain. As if you are the scope of the divine, as if your eyes glare at mortals, your mundane audience, your power striking a harmonious night, illuminating an otherwise tranquil sky. We merely aspire glimpses of your sacred face, your majesty, transient yet frightening. So much so that I faithfully yawn to strip off your electric veil, to immerse in your grasp of the storm, to catch your dazzling brightness, to thank you for dislodging my fear of the night, for lighting up the shadowed way ahead. I was a child who was obsessed with the natural world. I'd immerse myself in the caressing breeze, listening to the flow and sound of the wind. I'd made eye contact with insects and animals, trying to share our feelings. I'd also sat on the stone stairs in the mountains, silently enjoying the peace and harmony of Mother Nature. As a result, I gradually developed my personal view of nature, believing that everything in nature has its own soul and perspective to observe the world. Soon, I learned about the various crises facing nature, and the most commonly discussed one was climate change. Human activities, including factories, deforestation, power generation, and etc., gradually push climate change's severity to new records. For instance, a report from Amazon, a nonprofit research institute in Brazil, showed that the overall deforestation from 2019 to 2022 reached 35,193 square kilometers as Brazil 
experienced the worst levels of deforestation in 15 years in 2022. Stunning data and the seemingly unstoppable trend in climate change intimidated my young self. I wanted to contribute to measures that could relieve climate change. But the thought that I couldn't change anything as a young individual lingered in my mind. It might sound cliche, but it was indeed some wise words from my mother that enlightened me. She said, your generation is the future pillar that supports the world's future. These simple but potent words brought me an epiphany, the solution to my concerns regarding climate change. I realized the key to my solution was raising awareness among the young generation. I used to neglect the impact of the young generation because grown-ups around the world. However, my mother's line reminded me that climate change is a long-term crisis, yet the young generation will significantly impact the future world as time passes. My solution to climate change comes from my own experience as a student advocate. As technology grows and prospers, schools and students have gained access to various online resources like news, science articles, and nonprofit organizations that explain the causes and effects of different aspects of climate change. Thus, I advocate that schools add climate justice content in suitable schoolwork and activity settings. I firmly believe that students should learn about the ongoing effects of climate change rather than only repeatedly studying for academics, since everyone, especially the young generation, will be affected by the long-term climate change crisis. The seed of climate justice should be planted at a relatively early age to help form an environmental mindset and worldview. For instance, my Spanish teacher in school incorporated climate justice into her curriculum as the topic for essays and discussions. I'm actually currently in the process of writing a Spanish article on the impact of Amazon rainforest deforestation on biodiversity. This type of integration not only promotes climate justice, but also makes learning noticeably more enjoyable. My Spanish teacher even became ad my advisor after I discovered our shared interest in advocating climate justice. The use of technology in promoting climate change in after-school activities, like Model UN, also brings the discussions and on the outside world closer to students teaching them the simple fact that the world can be changed with collective effort. For example, I recently attended an online Model UN conference focused on eliminating world hunger, an issue directly related to climate change. Applications like Zoom allowed and helped bring delegates from all over the world to join together, which served as convenient platforms for students to think critically about possible solutions. Overall, my solution aims to initiate students' research and curiosity by gradually integrating climate justice into both academic and daily life. I am a perfect example of who was encouraged by my surrounding elements of climate justice. I made up my mind and determined to raise awareness by writing and publishing poems. My passion and favorite type of literature, partly due to my Spanish teacher's influence. I wanna use concise and beautiful words to hide profound meanings that leave the readers with space to think about humanity's relationship with nature and climate. I published my poems online on websites like online school publication, and I am currently working on my first poetry collection ebook that will be published online later this year. It's the technology that made my advocation possible and widespread due to the internet's easy access. To end my speech, I want to use another of my poems called Sunflower to elaborate my remarks further. I took a walk in the morning's after. There, in a glimpse, I spotted her, 
her presence. Standing upright, she turns. Her feet cling to the boiling soil, so tightly tangled, endures waves of hailing heat in toil. A climb, her single yet enormous eye, challenges the rays of a thousand lights. Inch by inch, purifies her soul, a kingdom with no nights. A dance, her golden hair dances in the breath of breeze, like long lean lashes, shadowing her eye from her knees. A transient life, blooming beauty fades in her haunching back. The cycle of life spins in tyranny. Seas gliding, approach the remote horizon, embark on an unknown journey. I sincerely hope our spirit in fighting climate justice can be as consistent and resilient as the sunflower in my poem. Thank you all for listening. Wow. <laughs> Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. David, and congratulations on your achievement. Uh, from your first story, um, actually, uh, greatest, uh, biggest takeaway is, uh, you know, the uh, you mentioned that uh, everything in nature has its own perspective of the world. So, and also thank you for reminding us throughout your uh, presentation that the younger generation needs to be uh, more aware and more conscious about the environment, the nature and climate, right? And also, about the future of the world. So thank you, David, uh, for your uh, presentation. So um, without further ado, uh, let's move to our next speaker. Uh, she's called, our uh, next speaker is uh, Chichiga Temur. She comes from Inner Mongolia, China. Her minority is Mongolia. Currently, uh, she is a junior at Hamdem Hall School. When she joined scientific research at uh, Sichuan Bana, about environmental related research in the ninth grade, she learned how to minimize human activity impact on nature and discussed the history of elephants in Xinguang Bama, China. She realized human activities threaten animals habitat and even some species are going to extinct. Hence, the event inspired her interest in uh, the impact of climate change on various areas of humans, humanity's life. So Ms. Titiger, you have the floor. Thank you. Hello, everyone. It's a Sally Tumar. It's a great pleasure to be here to share my thoughts. According to the World Bank, the effects of climate change might cost an estimated 100 million people to fall into extreme poverty by 2030, particularly those who depend on agriculture and those who live in locations that are vulnerable to natural catastrophes. If you are a farmer in Kenya, and possess a two arc plot of land. A sudden, severe drought brought on by climate change could ruin your crop yield for the entire year. While you hopelessly gaze at a cracking earth and yellow field devoid of any sign of life, you are unable to provide for your family's needs or turn your produce into money. Many such people in the same predicament will experience poverty and hunger. According to research from Science Progress, the most impacted by the climate change will be the individuals who produce the fewest greenhouse gas emission. It's unjust. We share the same air for both born on the earth and use its resources. As a result, everyone possesses inherent human rights, which include the right to climate justice. Regardless of race, color, country of region or level of income. Climate justice deal with the right divisions, fair sharing and equal distribution of the burden of climate change and its mitigation, as well as the duty to cope with the climate change. The facts of climate change are not evenly distributed around the world. The world's richest countries are not only emitting too much carbon, but they are also over consuming resources. According to Global Footprint Network, humanity is consuming about 70% more resources than Earth can regenerate each year. 
the average person in North America consumes about six times as many resources as average person in Africa. This means that if everyone on the planet lived like North Americans, we would need about five planets to sustain us. Rich people generally have a higher standard of living, which means that they consume more resources than poor people. This consumption of energy, water, and food contributes to the greenhouse gas emission that cause climate change. Poor people who already have limited access to basic resources and struggle to make their basic needs will be affected the most as the rich poor population become more severe. Promoting climate justice means that rich countries that have a moral duty should drastically reduce consumption to allow enough resources for poor countries to reach a decent standard of living. By consuming less, rich people can reduce their carbon footprint and contribute to reduce the overall impact of humanity's environment. If we do not take action, continuing our over current climate track could push 100 million people into extreme poverty by 2030. We cannot guarantee the same income for everyone and reduce disparity between rich and poor. However, to achieve justice, we should make sure vulnerable populations have opportunities to access more resources. Economic growth and technological advancement go hand in hand but climate justice cannot be achieved without global cooperation in this digital age. As we look towards the future, it is vital that we consider the impact of climate change on our road. The World Bank has recently warned us that if we do not act now, an additional 100 million people would be forced into extreme poverty due to the effects of climate change. This is a staggering number, and it is our duty to ensure that we take action to prevent this from happening. One of the key areas that will be most affected by the climate change is agriculture, particularly in low-income nations such as Bangladesh, India, Pakistan, and Sri Lanka. With over 500 million small farms worldwide, we must ensure that these communities are supported and protected. However, without economic support, the effects of climate change will have disastrous consequences, leading to the collapse of these farms and pushing those livings into extreme poverty to the brink of extinction. We must act now to assist the most vulnerable people in our world. This is why we must implement policies that promote global cooperation, mobilizing resources from developed nations to aid those who need it most. If everyone makes a small contribution, the 12 billion people in industrialized countries can produce a significant amount of useful resources that will make a real difference. Furthermore, we must focus on incorporating climate justice into national policies and plans, acknowledging that vulnerable populations such as low-income communities and indigenous peoples are disproportionately affected by the aftermath of climate change. By making these policy choices, we can change how people live, bring climate justice to everyone. Together, we can make a real difference let us join hands and work towards a sustainable future, ensuring that nobody is left behind. However, human's effort cannot be separated from technological progress. Here is a heartwarming story of how Ancoba, a solar energy company in Kenya, is transforming the lives of millions of households across Africa. Through their innovative pay-as-you-go solar system, rural households in particular are gaining access to affordable off-grid solar home systems. The impact of this affordable access to electricity is enormous, particularly for women in these households. 
for instance, owning a refrigerator, light, or machinery for food processing. Enables a household woman to save more time preparing food, save more money due to ability to store food, and even generate income gains. That makes seventy-one percent of women more likely to start a business. Furthermore, research in the Brazil indicates that girls in the rural areas with access to electricity are fifty-nine percent more likely to complement primary education than those without. The technological innovation made by Amcopa not only provide rural women with access to renewable energy, but they also improve resources distribution in quality and lead to climate mitigation. It is everyone's goal to make progress on technological innovation to decrease carbon emissions. But we must prioritize the needs of vulnerable populations by helping them meet their needs. Through low carbon emission approaches, we can achieve this by supporting companies like Amcopa and promoting similar initiatives worldwide. By providing affordable access to renewable energy, we can improve the lives of millions of people while also mitigating climate change. Currently, we have already emitted enough greenhouse gas. It contributes to climate change, which will make vulnerable populations have a tough time. According to World Health Organization, climate change is expected to cause an additional 250,000 deaths per year between 2030 and 2050, primarily due to malnutrition, malaria, diarrhea, and heat stress. This mainly points to the children under the age of the five. And people in the low-income nation countries, women, girls, indigenous peoples, and people of color in low-income communities, those populations need to be focused on. Helping them is saving a family. We live in the same home, Earth. We are family. We are responsible for helping our family members. In order to start that. We can start by buying green products and services, encouraging more companies to meet their green standard, or consuming fewer resources to avoid food waste. Also, we need to share stories of those who suffer most from the impact of climate change, spreading their encounters through social media to increase awareness and support. Business and political leaders. Can invest technological innovations research and support high-risk breakthrough energy companies, making low-carbon systems true. The only way we promote climate justice is if you do your part. Together, we can create a better future for our children and for us. Take action. Everything you've done will become a part of history. Your next generation will see your effort. Don't let them down. Thank you. Okay. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Miss uh, Titi Titiku, for your uh, insightful inputs. And in your presentation, you actually brought the issue of uh, climate injustice, pushing forward the debate and leading us to be more aware of the fact that. Actions actually、um, needs to be、uh, taken to reduce asymmetries, promoting、uh, global cooperation.、Um, yeah. So next on our agenda, we will also like to hear from、uh, Su Yirui. So、uh, Su Yirui graduated with honors from Boston、uh, Babson College, which is ranked first in the world in entrepreneurship and is currently working at a tech company. Uh, she is passionate and a creative woman with a firm belief in her mission to serve the community. So, Miss Su Yire, the floor is yours. Thank you, thank you, and hello, everyone. Today, I'd like to share a very powerful experiences that shaped my view on climate justice with you. So, when I was just ten years old, my parents, who are probably watching right now, brought me to volunteer at a Buddhist Compassion Relief Foundation. And、um, our task was to recycle bottles—a seamless, small task, but one that would have a profound impact on me.
As I was sorting through the bottles, I couldn't help but notice the smell and unsanitary contents inside. But what really struck me the most was the sheer amount of plastic bottles was being recycled. And as a 10 years old, I couldn't wrap my head around the fact that billions of bottles like this are sold and discarded every single day. So at the end of the day, I learned three things. The first one is I'm never drinking Coke or putting any used tissue into a plastic bottles. Two, the power of community is phenomenal. Being in a good influential community brings people energy and impact. And three, why are companies even using plastic bottles but not eco-friendly bottles? Stop using plastic bottles. Little 10 years old Sue screamed inside and kept asking herself, how do I get my voice louder? I don't know. And all I did after that was, was as an individual, I stopped drinking Coke. And that was the easiest thing for me at that time to do. More than 1.9 billion Coca-Cola is sold over 200 countries every single day. And what my brain is thinking, how many little Sue is going to take to recycle all these bottles? In America, we used to like to say, take a village. But guess what? That's not enough. I majored in entrepreneurship. So I like to take a bit of entrepreneur spirits everywhere and push my own critical thinking. Besides a mass question, how many suit does it take to recycle all the Coca-Cola bottles? I also wonder, like I was 10, why do they choose to use plastic bottles? But this time I do have some answers like profitability, convenience of transportation, short-term high ROI. More though, now that I'm older, I have more inquiries about decision-making. Who decides on short-term ROI? And also, what value is the company trying to bring? I wanted to scream again, but this time, I do know how to get louder. What I did, I took eco-psychology class in Costa Rica. I joined the tech world right after I finished my master at Babson. Thank goodness. And why, I, why do I love it? And what am I doing? To say the least, I keep finding the right communities to be a part of. In my current organization, I found a space that where it cares about social responsibility more than short-term ROI. And not only this tech company, but also many, many other companies, why are, while we are creating the most cutting edge technology, we're also standing on the side of people who are affected most and making sure that, that they're not left behind. Here, standing on this big chair of technology community, my voice could get louder and clearer as someone who happens to have the chance to work in the one of the most privileged industries. And as an individual, I realized my voice can get louder with the impact of the company. And that is exactly what we need to do together, make more socially consciously and environmentally friendly decisions. We need to stop defining success as maximizing profit in the short term, but to influence the key decision maker in the world to make their decisions based on sustainable development for the long term costs. To everyone, the good news is you don't need to purposely start a green business to advocate for climate justice. What we need is to acknowledge where exactly you are and sit on it own it and make the biggest impact through all channels because as individuals we all have a role to play in this fight and it's not enough to just simply recycle bottles or switch to reusable water bottle what we need is to advocate for a systematic change and push for more environmental friendly conscious practices in our workspace in our schools and our communities looking back Beyond on being a little Sue and continuously picking up one of the gazillion plastic bottles, I prefer to influence others in the organizations and collaboratively to make decisions that focus on sustainable development and climate justice. Thank you, everyone. Remember, we're in this together.
Okay, um, thank you very much, uh, Ms. Uh, e. Ray. Thank you for your inputs and uh, from your actually uh, volunteering experience at a very young age, um, you learned the impact of using uh, plastic bottles and uh, you let us actually uh, brainstorm about uh, recycling. Of course, you mentioned acknowledging who we are, advocating for uh, systematic uh, changes. So thank you very much, uh, Ms. Uh, e. Ray. Uh, last but not the least, we still have another speaker on our agenda, uh, who is Michael Zhang, uh, a high school junior uh, in the U.S. Uh, from a young age. Michael was passionate about promoting equity and curious about uh, solutions to society's uh, most pressing issues. He firmly believed that to uh, combat the issues effectively, everyone should have equal opportunities regardless of gender. So, uh, Michael... If you're there, the floor is yours. Good morning, everyone. Today, I'll discuss the relationship between climate justice and innovation and the themes of investing, youth engagement, and gender equality. I'm here to explain my optimism for the future, which is rooted in equality, innovation, education, and investment. Many of my peers would disagree with my optimism. In fact, seven in 10 Gen Zers are anxious about climate change, with more than half of the 16 to 25 year olds agreeing with the statement that uh, humanity is doomed. A TikTok trend, Core Core, where a series of random video clips are chaotically, chaotically arranged without meaning, perfectly captures Gen Z disillusionment. Broadly, it is not a specific set of events, but rather this overwhelming sense of hopelessness in the labor market, political environment, and climate change that drives Gen Z despondency. I empathize greatly with my um, generation's despair, but I'm nevertheless optimistic, if not hopeful. Yet a defense of the present is not a defense of inaction. Instead, I am hopeful because major developments in government, such as the Paris Climate Agreement, technological improvements, and committed investments, all show that concrete, commendable progress is being made. Paired with the passions of activists like Dominique Palmer and Greta Thunberg, change from all levels of power is being enacted. In the future, through a combination of activism, and increasing investment, public and systemic change can be further developed. On the one hand, my generation has become incredibly passionate about fighting climate change through technology with pressures demanding systemic change only increasing louder and louder in the future. On the other hand, with women and girls leading, increased public and private investment in climate-friendly technology and regulation there will be more and more advancements in the future. All of these potential accomplishments make me hopeful because they signify greater things to come. To explain the involvement of activism and investment in climate justice, it is first necessary to define what climate justice is. Climate justice describes the need for equity and policymaking for climate change. Climate justice sees that despite a difference in carbon emissions, and economic development, climate change already has drastic negative impacts on countries worldwide, disproportionately in low and middle income countries and among women and other minorities. As such, it is about protecting these marginalized communities from the effects of climate change while ensuring their economic development. While not a silver bullet, innovation and environmentally focused investment and address these problems that Gen Z activists highlight. Speaking about activism, the first reason for being optimistic about the future is the fact that my generation has successfully utilized the internet, social media to inform each other, making us incredibly passionate and highly engaged about climate change. For instance, Using memes, which are a commentary on popular culture, the popular Instagram site, Climate Change, Climate Change, 
spreads climate change awareness. Every second spent lingering on a happy meme describing the efficacy of solar power in Norway is the second being more conscious of climate change and its nuances. Similarly, other social media accounts like the Sunrise Movement or Chicks for Climate also encourage climate action. By encouraging, by creating infographics and posters, readers are exposed to the broader inequalities of climate change and are motivated to seek climate justice. Content creators like Maya Higa also raise awareness by streaming her wildlife sanctuary, home to numerous animals affected by climate change, poaching and illegal human activity. Sharing this access to knowledge creates global solidarity, moments to see others' lives, and the inequality with which climate change affects the disparity between high income and low to middle income countries means that the public pushes for climate change and is, and is successful from the ground up. Another reason for my optimism is the increase in socially responsible investment. Initiated mainly by women, it is an investment philosophy that prioritizes return in addition to caring about the company's social and environmental impact. For instance, 81% um, of the women polled so that they would refuse to invest in a company with a harmful business model. Socially responsible investors in another study are found to be twice as likely to be women than men. In the future, by increasing gender parity in finance, there will also be the added benefit of advancing climate justice from a nuanced perspective. 70% of the 1.3 billion people living in conditions of poverty are women. In urban areas, 40% of the poorest households are headed by women. Climate change disproportionately affects the poor. In turn, it disproportionately affects women. Despite these challenges, socially responsible investing has made an enormous positive impact by encouraging the adoption of ESG. ESG, or environmental, social, and governance, are socially responsible investors' criteria to evaluate whether a company is a sustainable investment option. For example, ESG criteria can include companies following emission standards, diversity initiatives, and maintaining corporate transparency. All in all, ESG is guided by the belief that companies are liable to their shareholders and in a broader context, the consumers, which is us. As such, companies that adhere to ESG also achieve the UN's sustainable development goals and gender equality and climate action. Socially responsible investing alongside the more traditional venture capital has brought forth massive innovation in the past decade to renewable energy. More innovation can be advanced by increasing investment in environmentally responsible and ESG adhering companies. In fact, $105 billion was invested into renewable energy in 2021, doubling the amount from 2019. This money has not gone to waste. Massive progress has been made in solar energy, one of the many potential renewable energy sources. One statistic, the cost of lithium ion batteries, the primary way solar power is stored, has fallen by 85% since 2010. And in fact, energy density has tripled between 2000 and 2010. Now, more and more people can easily access a reliable energy source. With the potential of solar as a reliable energy source, the fight against climate change has never been more positive. However, the battle for climate justice is not done. A unifying thread through my entire speech has been the outsized contributions by women to investing awareness and innovation. Yet despite being the protagonist in propagating climate justice, women are still fighting for in addition for, in addition for the equality in present, the opportunities and new jobs that ESG and renewables will create in the future. In conclusion, 
innovative and existing technologies are powerful tools for, promo for promoting climate justice. Using technology to educate citizens, store energy, and increase diversity, we can help ensure that everyone can participate in addressing climate justice. Thank you. Thank you very much, Michael, for your insightful and thought-provoking uh, remarks. Thank you very much. Um, I believe now um, we do want to allocate some time for our uh, Q&A session. So I'd like to uh, give the floor to uh, Ms. Emma to moderate the Q&A session. So please, Ms. Emma Chan, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you, moderator. So this is a Q&A. Um, we do have a few questions uh, pre either pre-submitted or is submitted uh, on the chat. So I'm going to uh, speak both in Chinese and English. I will be the translator. Uh,请大家在这个问答环节，我们在目前已经在这个提交的问题当中，呃，选取这个问题对我们的嘉宾进行提问。我会作为今天的这个翻译。第一个问题。是来自于, uh, uh, the first question is for Yarina. Yarina, are you there? Yes, I'm here. <laughs> okay. The first question is from UN perspective and your own personal point of view. For developing countries, what is the number one, the biggest obstacle for promoting and achieving climate justice and how to solve it? Thank you. Thank you for that question. It's a, definitely a tough one and a great one. Um, well, the obstacles are many, as we all know. Um, but from the UN perspective, I think what is important to mention is that the UN uh, finally is working towards aligning, for example, the climate uh, processes and the sustainable development processes with the human rights principles, uh, which has not been implemented for many years. And that, that's why we are seeing increasing inequality between countries and within countries as well. Um, another thing to, to say here is that um, in, the, in the fight against climate change, the countries are continuously adopting this uh, race to be the best country who is going to implement climate solutions. But not always this race is uh, in the perspective of guaranteeing equality as well um, and justice. So we cannot achieve you know, even if the country becomes the best country dealing with climate change, if we don't collaborate all together, we can uh, save the planet and we can uh, we can protect the most vulnerable people. Uh, so I think the first the first thing to do is uh, to engage everyone who is um, who is uh, who has to be um, at the table of conversations, and it can start on the global level, but it can go to the local level and on the le personal level as well. So um, even just if you are passionate about some, some aspect, as a lot of speakers mentioned today, it's very useful to look around and see who is on your same page and collect forces to do, to tackle together. And on the more global level, there's always a need to have a checklist of all the stakeholders and a guarantee that everyone is listened, is informed, and um, has the means to to understand what, um, what 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 is going on and what could be the possible solutions. And on the other side, it's very important to mention that no, there's no size that fits all the context of uh, implementing climate justice everywhere. So it's really need it, it really needs to be context specific. And uh, another thing that I really liked from a lot of speakers today, uh, they mentioned the indigenous practices, uh, which. For now, uh, if we are talking about the technology and digital age, uh, these indigenous practices are not recognized as actual technologies. Um, and so a lot of the times the new developments, um, technological developments are kind of like the uh, our uh, hope for the sustainable future, but it's not always like that. So um, it's really important to recognize these practices and um, and uh, collaborate with uh, with uh, everyone affected on the ground. Thank you. Thank you. Um, 
亚苏的于是回答到是联合国，呃，他现在目前最终想达到的是，也是非常重视的是，呃，这个气候呃变化的这个应对的政策，呃，应该与人权啊、呃、相关，呃，特别也要关注国家之间的不平衡的状态的存在，呃，应对气候的政策，呃，最好的啊、呃，目前有很多国家做的非常的好，呃，但是呢，他呼吁。呃，做得好的国家应该呃与寻求全球合作，应该与全球分享，而不是只是关注于个人。啊、呃，他个人认为，呃，气候应对是一个从全球层面到国家层面，甚至是到个人层面的共同应该应对的、应该重视的问题。呃，他更加呼吁就是这个大家一同共同应对、共同合作。他知道，他希望每个人都要知道，现在我们的地球正在发生什么样的状状况。我们还有目前有哪一些解决方案？我们应该共享这些解决的方案。呃，另外他也提到了，今天有几位嘉宾提到了回归农业。呃，特别现在是这个科技非常啊高速发达的现在，呃，而且现在是这个经济高度发达。呃，他个人认为，还是一切要回归到呃本源，就是大家应该知道，呃。气候变化正在发生什么？我们有什么样的解决方案？呃，更重要的是要共同的合作。谢谢 ，Thank you. Uh, the next question is for both um Lily and Bowie. Are you there? Okay, can you turn on your mic for Lily and Bowie? Both of you graduated from the uni from the top universities. Did you have any pressure from your family when you choose this path, meaning the non-traditional way, working for not working for the big companies? Instead, you all work or in the, intended to work on the farm or with the farmers. The question is for Lily and Bowie. Would you like to go, Lily? <laughs> sure, I'll start off. Um, I'm very lucky to have a very supporting family. But、um, I'd say, yeah, there was a bit of pushback, some fear around my ability to make a living with it.、Um, I think it's common for the people who love you to worry about you more than usual.、Um, with most things, though, once they saw my passion for farming and the way my eyes lit up when I would talk about it, they started to understand. And、um, you know, I don't intend to put pressure on. My passion of farming to make me a living one day, but I really hope to be able to integrate my passion for it with sustainability and my MBA, and、um, potentially work for big companies in the future to make a difference within those things. Okay, um, Lily 女士的回答是啊， um, 我很幸运有一个非常支持我的家庭，但是对我来说呢，还是有点阻力的。因为有些人担心我如何以农业为生，因为爱你的人总是比你自己更担心你。不过，呃，当他们看到我对农业的热情，以及我谈论农业时的我的双眼发亮的时候，他们就开始理解了。我有一天能以农业为生，呃，谋生。我希望能够将我对农业和可持续发、可持续性发展的热情，还有我的 MBA 结合起来。为大公司工作，呃，或者与大公司合作有所作为。谢谢。Um, thanks for the question. For me,、um, the pressure didn't come from my family; rather, it came from society and society standards of what success should look like, what prosperity should look like. So, you know, make a lot of money or work for big companies and.、Um, After doing a lot of unlearning, I realized that it's not mentally healthy for me to judge myself on those standards that and values that I just completely don't agree with.、Um, and I, in fact, did work for a big company.、Uh, I tried it; not my thing, not my calling. So now、um, my work enriches my life instead of drains my life.、Um, I am balanced and I have meaning and.、Um, Why farming?、Uh, farming is a participatory ecology. It is the closest way humans interact with nature.、Um, so we need to do it right. So I want to be part of that. Thank you. 
Okay, thank you. Bowie, ah, 女士的回答是啊，谢谢这个好问题。我的家人呃，其实非常的支持我。我的压力不是来自于家人，而是来自于社会。啊，我的家人没有强迫我做任何的事情，他们非常支持我。我，但是我受到了社会和社会上所谓成功标准的压力。啊，在成长的过程当中，我意识到我应该不应该用别人的，我不应该用别人的标准和价值观来判断我自己的选择。啊，比如进入大公司赚大钱。我出于名校，毕业后也顺利的进入进入了一家国际大型公司工作。我尝尝试过了，但这不是我的使命。我现在选择的农业与农业相关的工作，丰富了我的生活，而不是消耗了我的生命。我觉得心灵的平衡，并且我在工作中得到的意义，啊，是啊，非常的重大的。农业是人类与自然最接近的互动的方式。我们这一代需要做对的事情。Thank you， 谢谢。嗯、uh, ，We have questions for 嗯、uh,。The younger generation, for、uh, Daniel, Chichi Ge, and Michael. The question is,、um, can you turn on your mic? Thank you. As a younger generation, what is your top message for adults regarding fixing climate change? 作为青少年，对于解决气候变化问题，你最想对大人们说的一句话是什么？谢谢。Uh, I can go first. So, from my perspective, I think I would say that、um, climate change should be、uh, prevented with a kind of collective effort from both younger and older generation, as I talked about in my speech. And it is definitely vital for adults to pass on the kind of importance of climate justice to the younger generation to、uh, bring awareness in kind of this area, an era with much trivial information. And because there are so many things that the younger generation is surrounded with, as like technology advanced,、um, so as a result, they focus more on like trivial information and tasks that fill up like kind of our time schedule every day, and、uh, we tend to focus more on ourselves than what is actually happening in the world. And that's why I think it it is crucial for adults to remind. Them of、uh, us of bigger things that impact everyone, like my what my Spanish teacher reminded me of, and、um, especially when it's an issue that will influence the younger generation more, since、uh, it will always grow bigger as time passes, like uh, like uh, climate change. Yeah, thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, thank thank you, Daniel. Um, Daniel 说，呃、uh, ，我们应该通过年轻一代。和老一代的共同的努力，来防止气候的变化。正如我刚才在演讲中所提到的，啊、呃，这个我们的成年人必须将气候正义的重要性传递给传递给我们年轻的一代。嗯、呃，在这个信息繁多的时代，呃，要呃提高保护环境的意识啊、呃，这一点是至关重要的。啊、呃，现在我们的社会呃呃提倡的更多的是关注自己。啊，但是 Daniel 认为，我们应该更多的关注地球，就像他的西班牙语的老师告诉他，啊，我们更多的是要关注我们自己身身自己自己之外的一些啊世界上的问题。谢谢。Next， so uh my top message for the adults is。Um, everyone, like every contribution you made to combat climate change, is priceless and influential. Like who knows it? Your children, your grandchildren, and people who read your history in the future—they both will know this. Okay, thank you, Sally. Ah,、uh, 谢谢 uh, uh, Sally. Ah, he says, 就是呃，从他的观点来说，他想特别想对大人们说，啊，您对。应对这个气候变化所做的每一项贡献，都是无价的，都是很有影响力的，都会影响到您的孩子、您的孙子，历史都会，历史都会记住你们的贡献。谢谢 Sally。啊 ，Michael。Um, my message would be that it's important to approach climate change from a positive and optimistic perspective. Um, 
a lot of um the older generation in my life are very pessimistic um and even nihilistic about um the outcomes for climate change um i disagree with that i think if you have if your mindset has already given up before the fight even began you know there's no way you can win the fight in the first place um i think if we are to approach climate change from a positive mindset um we can do great things because we are motivated we are hopeful and we have belief um in ourselves thank you uh, Michael 对大人最想说的一句话就是让我们看起来好像毫无希望正能量的充满这个希望的态度去应对这些事情谢谢 Michael Very good Thank you 谢谢这个年轻的一代 Your message is very powerful Thank you And the last question is for uh, Sue um, Sue, uh, getting re get ready uh, You are coming from a world famous uh, Unicom uh, te technology company What is your view regarding applying chat GDP for climate justice? 苏小姐，你就职于国际著名的互联网公司，你对ChatGPT对气候公平的应用有什么想法？谢谢。Thank you, Emma, and thank you for that question. Well, I think coming from like ChatGPT belongs to technology company, and then so I think this question more on like how can technology applies on climate justice specifically for ChatGPT, and we all know ChatGPT could be greatly used in a lot of fields. And one of the, I think, combining my personal interest with the application, I think will be uh, definitely education accessibility and customization in terms of climate justice. Because we all know education and education resources are not super fair due to climate justice. And more so, I like to say all the students, each of the students are very unique and their mastery of concepts and skills varies a lot. Some might need to uh, learn it easily and while well, someone else might need hands-on help. And myself is an example too. So this gap will, de uh, will only deepen when the epidemic disrupts countless education systems. So I think accessibility to education and customization uh, in terms of like how people within different needs will be, uh, this could be a great help. And ChatGPT can be a definitely super helpful tool to gap on that. Thank you. 我们都知道这个ChatGPT可以在很多领域得到很大的应用,特别是在应对气候变化。然而,ChatGPT作为获得教育和针对不同需求的人进行这个定制性的教育是有很大的帮助。所以我认为ChatGPT也将成为弥补这一差距的重要工具。谢谢嘉宾们。Thank you very much for the panelists, uh, for your speech, and also for your um, Q&A. So now, I, uh, the floor is uh, moderators. Thank you. Thank you very much, Emma, and thank you for um, the speakers. We've actually come uh, to the end of our um, session. So to conclude, uh, I would just say that um, digitalization and innovation can be uh, promising tools in the fight uh, against climate change besides uh, influencing greenhouse gases emissions and mitigation uh, strategies. Uh, digitalization and innovation uh, they affect uh, matters of climate change, including the way um, the impacts of global warming and the core benefit of climate protection are distributed. So, for example, the uh, to advance fair benefit uh, sharing of digital climate technologies, the decentralization of technological development must be uh, initiated and rules uh, for fair competition must be established. Therefore, um, actions in several areas uh, and the shaping of digitalization are necessary to govern the societal implication of these uh, urgent uh, development. 
So we we heard a perspective from uh, seven different speakers, and I believe all of you are going back with uh, some more knowledge about climate justice, innovation, and digitalization. So uh, thank you to all the speakers for uh, sharing uh, your insights and expertise, and uh, thank you very much. A big, a big thank you to uh, the audience's attention. Thank you. Yeah, I believe uh, there is a, yeah, so um, uh, Emma, I think back to you, maybe if we need a 